Hello. Still, the executive seems to be divided over how best to handle aspects of the continuing COVID-19 crisis. This time last week, it was reopening cemeteries they couldn't agree on. Tonight, it's churches and garden centres. When I spoke to Michelle O'Neill earlier this evening, I began by asking her if her executive colleague Edwin Putz from the DUP is right to be calling publicly for churches and garden centres to be allowed to open again. Well, what we said is that um, the measures which we've been asking people to implement and to adhere to are quite draconian and we're asking people to bear with us because the virus is obviously still with us. Um, the executive has said that it will review the measures before the 9th of May and we're actively looking at that work now. So throughout the course of next week, we'll be able to arrive at a position where, based on the evidence, because we have to all, always um, follow the science and all of these things, Mark, and the executive position is that we will review all these things um, next week. Uh, he says it would be reasonable if it's controlled and people are sensible. Does he have a point? Well, I think you have to always remember that uh, people are still dying. Uh, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. We're far from out of the woods. And um, I think that people understand that people are still dying. Today, nine more people have died and lost their battle to, on, on COVID-19. So I think that uh, people have to understand that um, every measure which you take and every relaxation that you make you have to mitigate the, the risk that comes with that because everything does come with the risk. And there's always this balance between, you know, the public health, protecting the public, and then being reasonable in terms of allowing people some comfort and some easements. But we're not in the space um, yet where we can relax our measures. We're very much guided by the science and all of this. And we have said that next week we will review these things and we'll communicate that to the public. We're not um, asking people to do things or being difficult for any reason other than that we're trying to save lives. And whenever the time is appropriate and right, and that is next week, we look at all of these things. But I think it would be um, fair to say to the public that they shouldn't expect any huge jump. There's no big bang moment here. I think people are very anxious about the restrictions. I can see it around me every day, at Mark, where people are moving about more than they had been over the previous three weeks. And that's very worrying because we are still in the middle of this and we still have this battle in our hands. And we won't ask people to do things for any longer than necessary. Um, I'll come on to that guidance that you're talking about in just a moment, if you don't mind. But I just want to stick with this for a moment or two more. Arlene Foster said on this programme last week, expert guidance had previously been given to the executive to say cemeteries could have opened earlier than they eventually did. What expert advice has the executive received about the reopening of cemeteries and garden centres? Can you just spell that out for me, please? So what we said last week was that we listened very carefully to people who were very anxious, particularly in relation to the issue of um, visiting graves. Because at a time right now when people are dying, families aren't having their normal grieving processes, they're not able to have their normal wake and their funerals, they're not able to be surrounded by their loved ones, they're not able to get a hug from their family. So for some people, getting comfort at a graveside is the only thing that they have right now. So that's why we relaxed that one measure. But you can make a case for every single thing that's come forward. You can make a case for garden centres. You can make a case for um, opening up churches. You can make a case for all of these things. And, and, and as a standalone issue, they might sound very reasonable. But we are in the midst of the public emergency. We're not out of the woods. And everybody moving about more means that the virus is spreading more. So we're asking people to stick with us. And actually next week, we'll be in a position where we're able to look at what measures or what, what slight easements we're able to make because I want to give people some hope that there's, that there's light at the end of this tunnel. We're guided all the time by a number of pieces of information. We're guided by the impact that each measure will have. So that's from the Chief Scientific Officer, the Chief Medical Officer. We're guided by the, the best examples of them around the world and we're guided by the World Health Organization. That has to be our barometer as, as we move um, through this. So we've asked people, whenever we set out the regulations, we said we'd review them in three weeks. We're actually near the end of that three weeks now. So bear with us, I think is the message that from the executive as a whole actually is to bear with us and that we're, we're reviewing these things and we look at them and communicate that with you next week. But Deputy First Minister, just, it is our say, on the... clear understanding that the executive has already been given very specific guidance that churches could open for individual acts of prayer, but garden centres should remain closed. Is that right? The executive, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer in the Department of Health were asked by individual ministers to look at a range of issues. This is not a time for us to pick out the issues that, that we want to do. What we need to make sure is that we communicate to people in a very reasonable, in a very thought out, in a very meticulous way. We're always guided by the science. When we brought the regulations in very late on Saturday night at the very start of this pandemic, we said that we review them every three weeks. That date is now, uh, we've extended that again, obviously, and that date is now before the 9th of May, we're going to review these things. Let's not every day dilute the public message by picking out 
this issue, that issue and all issues, because I can, I can easily make a case for all those things. Let me pick up on the issue of, of um, visiting churches, for example. You know, we can't have people coming together, and even the church leaders themselves recognise that, that we're not nowhere near the space yet where people can come together to pray in yeah, our churches. Yeah, but what we're talking However, about here, Michelle yeah. O'Neill, is, is churches reopening for individual prayer. That's what Edwin Putz is suggesting could happen. Um, and that's what, as I understand it, the executive has already been told would be possible, would be permissible. Well, I think you have to, again, remember, what's the public health message here? What are we asking people to do right now? We're asking people to stay at home, to only go out if it's necessary. As I said, you can make a case for all these things individually, but collectively, they all have a big, big impact. All these things that we've been asked to do, it's all about bringing down the virus spread. It's about trying to save lives. And we said we'd review them before the 9th of May, and that's what the executive is going to do. We're asking the public to bear with us to make sure we work our way through this. I'm sensitive to all these issues. I hear all the arguments about uh, different issues, not least the issue of churches. I met with all the church leaders last week. Uh, we engaged in all of this and we said we work our way through it as best we can. For example, if someone went into that church to, prayer, to pray by themselves, who's going to come in behind that person and make sure that they clean that surface to make sure that there's no transmission of the virus? These things are not simple. They're not black and white. They're not straightforward. What we need to do is carry on with the public health message. We're saving lives. Look at the difference that we've been able to make by the measures that have been brought in. We're nowhere near where we thought we could be. Six weeks ago, when we were standing up in the assembly and we, were we had our first case, our first death here, and we were telling people about what we were asking them to do. The place that we were then was a very, very dark place. Where we are today is a very different place, albeit still very challenging. You know, whenever you lose 347 people who've lost their lives, They've lost their lives because this virus is all around us. It's in our communities, it's spreading. So all these initiatives that, or all these measures that people want us to, to, to um, reduce or to relax, they have to realise that all comes with an impact. And the impact is that the virus spreads more. We need to look at these things in the round. We can't just pick and choose. On Monday we'll do this and on Tuesday we'll do that. Let's not dilute the public message, the public health message. Stay at home. Next week the executive will review all of these things and then come to an agreed position and communicate that with the public. So just to be clear, we can expect an announcement from the executive next week. Can you tell me exactly when we can expect that and how wide ranging that statement is likely to be? So the executive has said that we review all of the regulations. So all these measures which we've asked people to adhere to, the social distancing, um, you know, the, 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 the staying at home, all those things that we've asked people um, to do. So the executive is actually working our way through those uh, things now and we continue to do that. But we've said we'd do it before Saturday the 9th, uh, which is next Saturday. Um, but I don't think it'd be wise to communicate that message at, at the weekend. So certainly um, before uh, somewhere in the middle of the week, we hope to be in a position where we'll be able to say to people, this is what's going to happen. This is what we've looked at. This is what we can relax. This is what we can't relax. And I hope we to be able to communicate with that. But also alongside that, I know maybe you want to come on to talk about this, but the whole exit and lockdown, that conversation and about what the executive will be doing around managing that. And I'm happy to discuss that uh, a bit more as well, um, Mark, because the executive is looking at how we ease the restrictions whenever we can ease the restrictions. Um, and we're looking towards doing that um, at the start of the week and being able to communicate our plan from the executive to the assembly uh, and be able to communicate that with the wider public around you know, when we'd be in a position to be able to make some uh, changes because any changes we make next week will obviously be minor changes. Just before we leave this subject, Deputy First Minister, are you frustrated that your executive colleague Edwin Putz decided to go on a solo run on this in the knowledge, presumably, that an announcement is going to be made next week about a united executive position? Well, I think it's unhelpful. I think that it's important that the public hear this message from us next week, that, that we communicate that as best that we can, given the challenge and circumstances in which we all live in. Um, given the need for us to be able to uh, communicate that as best that we can. So um, I want us to be in a position next week where we have joined up executive agreement. We can stand over it because of the science tells us that we can't stand over it and that we communicate that with people. And we tell people very honestly that we are in for a bumpy road ahead, that there is no quick fix here, that we're going to have to work our way through it as best as we can. Um, none of us have been here before, but we're all trying our very, very best. But um, there, there's clearly, uh, in my mind, a need for us to be able to get that message driven home to people very clearly that please keep doing what you're doing because we are actually having a very positive impact on bringing down the, the, the transmission of coronavirus. You say Mr Putz's 
public comments have been unhelpful, but um, isn't the reality that he's effectively following your lead? You set the ball rolling whenever you went on a solo run about the lockdown in the first instance five weeks ago, whenever you said that you thought schools should close before the executive position was that schools should close. You started it. The, and, and Well, <laughs> we're not on the playground, Mark. This is a very serious situation. This is about saving lives. I spoke out very clearly after not being able to get any resolution in the executive around a very serious issue. Um, I stand over my position that the British, the British government have been far too slow to act. They know they were far too slow to act. They've been criticised worldwide around their, their, permit, their position. They were too slow in terms of testing and tracing and isolating that policy which they rejected on the 12th of March. So I stand over the, 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 the points that I made. That's very different. Uh, than, than going out and taking a solo run um, on, on, a, on, a, on an issue which you just, you just want to stomp your feet and feel, and feel uh, anxious about. I made my view very clearly on your programme and I stand over the view and I think that this is not the time for that but I know that in the cold light of day, whenever the analysis comes to the other side of this, I believe that the British government will be shown to have acted far too slow. You say, Michelle O'Neill, this is a very serious issue and you want to treat it very seriously. How did it then benefit the people you represent for Mary Lou Macdonald, your party president, to suggest in the Sunday Times last week that this health crisis is a greater accelerant towards a united Ireland than Brexit? Well, firstly, I mean, I believe that we need an all-in approach to tackling COVID-19 and Mary Lou was making that uh, point very clearly. She was doing a very wide-ranging um, interview uh, which covered many, many areas. Um, but I, I mean, it's no secret that uh, the disease trajectory on this island has been followed a very similar pattern, north and south. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we, if you know, we signed a memorandum of understanding on an all-island basis, and one of those things was that we would share our modelling. Our data set was run through the south um, data set, and it showed th the same result as what we have in terms of our own modelling. So we need to work across this island to be able to combat COVID-19, and even more so, given where we are now, we need to work together to, br to bring ourselves out of the restrictions that we're now in. We need to work collectively across this island where we can, we have a geographical advantage, which we must use to our people's best advantage. Yeah, you, you can, of course, um, talk about an all-island health approach without calling for constitutional change. Why did Mary Lou Macdonald choose to conflate those two issues and make a personal political point out of it? Mary, Mary Lou Macdonald is the leader of Irish Republicanism. Mary Lou Macdonald is the leader of Sinn Féin. It's not a secret that she's an Irish Republicanism or, an Irish, or that she's an Irish Republican who wants to see Irish unity. She was asked a question as part of a whole wide range of questions about Tory austerity, about Brexit, and then about obviously the crisis which we now face in COVID-19. This is not a political uh, point, Mark. This is, a, this is about let's divorce identity from this uh, crisis. This is for me all about saving lives. Everything that we have done from day one has been about saving lives. It is so no there's a time that, and a place. So uh, why what, raise the issue of identity? Why raise the issue of a united well, just, Ireland? And just, why blur the message, the important health message that you say has to be got across to people? Why do you bother introducing another issue which isn't strictly relevant? Well, let me say this. I think it'll not be lost in your viewers at home that every time I, or Mary Lou Macdonald, or anybody else who's an Irish Republican, raises the issue of Irish unity, it's uproar. It's, you know, let's not do that, now is not the time. But when anybody from the Unionist tradition raises the issue of Britishness or identity or the Union, then we don't see the same uproar. So let's not go down this, this route. For me tonight, I'm here on your programme to talk to, to the public at large about what we need to be doing in terms of battling COVID-19. For me, this is not about politics. This is not about Dublin's approach, London's approach. This is about what saves lives here. I'm represented to, to look after the people of the north of Ireland. I follow the World Health Organization. I'm looking to other countries around the world. I'll do what's right for the people here. That's the focus and that's the conversation that I think we need to focus on tonight. If you think it's important for um, members of the executive to have a united approach, do you think that um, ministers should equally take the rap that was delivered today from the UK Statistics Agency reprimanding the Department of Health over its reporting of the COVID-19 figures. Hardly inspires confidence in the executive, does it? Well, I, I just noted that on the way up to do the interview this evening. I haven't read the detail in any way, but I, I would be very, be very clear in saying that the public deserve the fullness of information, the public deserve transparency, they deserve to know each and every number of, uh, of deaths that have occurred as a result of COVID-19. Um, I welcome the fact that the Health Minister has today said that he was going to uh, speak with NISRA around trying to uh, improve that situation, so perhaps he knew that letter was coming, I don't know, um, I haven't got a chance to, to speak to him. 
Um, but you're right, we have a collective executive. We try to work together as best we can. We're five parties, five, 35 different uh, political outlooks. Uh, that is very, very challenging and very hard to work away uh, through. Each minister has their own autonomy, um, but I have tried throughout all of this, uh, as I think we all have, uh, to work our way through this together as best we can, because we have a unity of purpose in trying to save lives and do our best by the people that we represent. Um, of clear, of, of, there's no doubt, you know, we're always going to have differences of opinion. There'd be something wrong if we didn't, um, Mark. But when it comes to this issue of um, transparency, um, I'll make sure that the, uh, tomorrow morning's executive, this is one of the things that we will discuss, and we need to give the people the confidence that the information that they're getting is actually the correct information. Does that, um, Deputy First Minister, extend to business support? Because we had confirmation today of grant support for businesses that are renting properties here. They've been left out of the scheme for now. To your knowledge, are there any other strands of business which are still looking for support which haven't yet received any? Yes, yeah, so there are a number of categories of business that have been left out of the support. So obviously this has been a bit of a drip feed in terms of the information that was coming initially um, from Britain. So a lot of these schemes are being run by the Treasury, given that the executive has very limited uh, raising powers uh, in order to be able to raise their own finances, to be able to fund some of these things. So some of those schemes have come forward, but out of the 912 million that was allocated to the executive, a considerable amount of that has now been paid out uh, through various different forms of support not just for the business community, although that's very important also, but you know, through our food parcels, through communities, through universal credit, through all the other areas that we have been um, investing a lot of energy and, and finances in to make sure we get the right supports to people at the right time. But in terms of business, there are a number of categories of businesses that have been left out and we expect to get a hardship fund being brought forward to the executive, um, if not tomorrow, but certainly um, at the start of next week. That's the economy minister's responsibility and she has told us that she is going to bring forward a hardship fund that looks towards people, for example, like sole traders, those people that are self-employed that have fallen outside all of those other schemes. So it's important that where we can plug, plug the gaps that we do. One final, final question on Brexit, because it hasn't gone away. Is it your view that the government is frankly wrong to be pushing ahead with the current timetable on negotiating a trade deal with a view to the UK leaving the EU formally on December the 31st, come what may? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think they've been dragging their, their, their feet. I mean, we didn't, you know, the majority of people here didn't uh, support Brexit. And I think that given the economic catastrophic consequences for our economy because of COVID-19, that compounded with a Brexit, which we didn't ask for, I mean, leaves us in, a, in, a, in such a precarious um, situation. So um, I, I believe that they should, um, well, one, I think they should cancel Brexit. And if that's not going to be the case, then secondly, I believe that there should be an extension because I don't think that we can cope with all these shocks. Business often tell you that they can cope with a shock, they can come back from a shock, but shock after shock is not going to be good for building our economy.